Welcome. I'm delighted that you're joining us this evening for this very special Tea Time Talk, Bally Far Out, the move to the suburbs remembered through story and song. And for those of you who are new to Tea Time Talks, this is a series of talks inspired by the history and people of 14 Henrietta Street in Dublin 1. And 14 Henrietta Street is a social history museum that tells the story of Dublin life from one building's Georgian beginnings to when it was a tenement. It's run by Dublin City Council Culture Company, who run cultural initiatives in buildings with and for the people of Dublin. My name is Kate, and in a couple of minutes, I'm going to hand you over to today's speaker, Donal. But before we start, I just want to let you know um, a few bits of housekeeping. So first of all, there will be time to ask questions at the end of the talk. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, down at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A box that you can type your questions into, and we will get to as many as we can at the end. Um, this talk is being recorded. So it will be shared at a later date over our channels. And if you want to find out when it's available and find out about other events, you're very welcome to sign up to our newsletter. I'll pop a link for that um, into the chat after I've handed over to Donal. And the talk today is in celebration of a book that 14 Henrietta Street has recently published called 14 Henrietta Street from Tenement to Suburbia, 1922 to 1979, written by Donal Fallon, who will be your host this evening. It's one of three books which tells the story of the house from when it was the Georgian townhouse to when it was a tenement. Each book covers a different period of that history. And Donal's book, the third in the series, talks about the move to the suburbs. They've just um, launched the past couple of days. They're not academic books. They're really accessible if you just have a general interest in Dublin social history. So I will also put a link to where you can buy them in the chat after handing over to Donal. So a bit of an introduction to Donal Fallon. Uh, he is a historian, lecturer and author based in Dublin. His publications include a biography of Major John McBride by O'Brien Press and a history of Nelson's Pillar by New Island Books. He is co-founder of the award-winning social history website Come Here to Me and presents the Three Castles Burning podcast. Donal currently works as a historian and guide with 14 Henry Street, and he was involved in the original oral history project during the development of the museum. And he's going to be taking you through the story of the move from the tenements to the suburbs today with guests Peter Brannigan, Phelan Drew, Brian Brannigan from A Lazarus Soul and Brian Mooney. So without further ado, I will hand over to Donal and enjoy the talk. Lovely. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on something that's a little bit different from uh, our usual events. Uh, I'm not on my normal laptop, by the way. I know the, the, the video is a little bit skippy, but the audio is fine. Uh, and that's really what matters. And anyway, today is not about looking at me. Today, we're going to be sharing with you uh, three videos which were produced to mark the launch of our new series of books on 14 Henrietta Street and its history. Uh, Melanie Hayes, a historian of Georgian Dublin, produced uh, 14 Henrietta Street, Grandeur and Decline, 70, 1750 to 1800. Absolutely beautiful uh, front cover to that book. My old friend Tim Murta took up the 19th century, Dublin's long and difficult 19th century, uh, Henrietta Street, Grandeur and Decline. And I was given the task of telling the story of the street and the house from 1922 to 1979. Uh, Henrietta Street from Tenement to Suburbia, and that's its front page there, its cover. This was, I suppose, of the three books, uh, the most peculiar on one level in the sense that it's a living history. And this book kind of became uh, more by accident and design, though we embraced it when it became obvious it was going to be something of an oral history. So while my name is on the front of it, and you know I'm, I'm the historian who pulled it together, I do feel it's fair to say uh, my book is very much a collaboration uh, with many people who lived in number 14, Henrietta Street, on the street itself and, you know, on, on in inner city Dublin uh, more broadly. And I'm really grateful to all the people who contributed uh, their memories to the book. So what we're going to do today, I suppose, is in, engage with these three uh, great videos. But I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of each one uh, before we see it. I want to really emphasize that point about this book is an oral history book. Uh, I think, you know, it, the insights that people shared with me tell us how people lived, worked, how they played, how they struggled in an expanding Dublin. And they brought really fresh perspectives to the subject. 
uh, a lot of things that don't make it into the archives that historians like the troll true you know are kept uh, in the deeper archive of, of human memory and the your tenement memories program program where we've like gone out into dublin into libraries into community centers uh, into parish halls and everything else you can imagine and we've asked people to share their stories uh, with us that is an ongoing project so if you took part in your tenement memory so far you may find yourself uh, in this book but I, I look forward to going back uh, out into Dublin suburbia and capturing more of those stories there are two songs in my book uh, and we're going to hear them both today one I quoted uh, in the introduction I think it's a very beautiful song a very moving song from the band a lazarus soul and later we'll hear brian brannigan uh, from that band and the legendary brian mooney giving us a rendition uh, of the long balconies there's also three lovely lassies from kimmage uh, a song with great humor many will know the dubliners rendition of it and phelan drew who works with us uh, in 14 henrietta street will, will bring that one uh, to life and then very very special in the middle of the two songs we're going to have an interview with peter brannigan who was born in 14 Henrietta Street and whose family lived uh, over the years in two different rooms in the house. So those three videos are the centerpiece of this all today. I suppose it's worth giving a little bit of background uh, before we hear three lovely lassies from Kimmage uh, in terms of, you know, I think the clips that you're going to hear today, they reflect the three great periods of suburbanization in 20th century uh, Dublin. So first of all, you have those early suburbs, you know, Merino, followed by Cabra, Crumlin and of course Kimmage. When we talk to Peter, we come to a new era of suburbanization uh, in the mid-century that was a little bit further out. You know, Johnny Kearney, uh, where his family went, uh, and Ballyfermot or Ballyfair out, uh, as some christened it, where my own family went. And then finally, and I suppose most contestedly, uh, before we hear the long balconies, we'll talk a little bit about the suburbs of the 1960s uh, onwards. You know, Ballymun, Talla. Uh, and the like. And in fact, the first line of that Lazarus Soul song, first day of April, 1963. Merino, in many ways, was the beginning uh, of the Dublin suburban experiment post-independence. And in this book, we reproduce some of the beautiful uh, designs and plans for Merino. It was a garden suburb scheme with tremendous emphasis on green space, playgrounds and community was very much in keeping with the style of suburban development that was in fashion on the neighboring island in that period uh, between the two world wars. Now, the first government of the state, Cumann and Ale, opted for a kind of tenant purchase model, something which aimed to create property owners out of those who acquired those beautiful new houses uh, in Merino. But the Irish Times made a very valid point about the Merino housing scheme. They said that the new Merino tenants are the aristocracy of labor in Dublin. The housing problem is being solved, how slowly, by a process of moving up. Uh, the Merino scheme reminds me in a lot of ways of the Dublin artisan dwelling company houses that you find in places like Portobello uh, and Stony Batter, Harold's Cross from the late 19th and very early 20th century. We all know those beautiful little red brick and yellow brick houses uh, that lined the streets of Dublin 8 and Dublin 7. And while they were magnificent in terms of design, uh, they were unfortunately just priced slightly too high in terms of rent uh, for general labourers in Dublin. In other words, the mass of the working class, you know, could only dream of living uh, in, such, in such dwellings. And the same, I think, was true uh, of the Merino scheme. You know, while it was a, a step in the right direction, it was a leap too far as far as Dublin's poorest workers were concerned. But then in the 1930s came an incredible wave uh, of new suburban developments, a time for thinking big. And as one contemporary commentator put it beautifully, the political problems of Ireland are of little consequence when compared with the social problems. And few of the social problems seem as bad as that of providing housing accommodation for the inhabitants of Dublin. The question is linked up with the removal of the slum population, the decent homes, and the fact that a substantial part of the people living in the city cannot aff afford to pay the rent on decent homes, no matter how small they may be. In the 1930s, I suppose one thing which happened, of course, was the election of the first Fianna Fáil government. 
Uh, they came to power in 1932 on a promise of going to war with the slums. And there was massive reform introduced in 32, uh, including the establishment of a housing architect for the city of Dublin for the first time. Dublin's first housing architect was George Herbert George Sims, H.G. Sims, an unlikely hero for the city, a veteran of the First World War who'd served with the Royal Field Artillery. He'd seen the worst of the war. Afterwards, a scholarship uh, from Liverpool University allowed him to study architecture. He studied public housing, and that was very much to the benefit uh, of Dublin. And we see his work, of course, in the inner city, in the beautiful Art Deco flats on both sides of the river. Uh, we have some of them right beside us in 14 Henrietta Street. You can see Henrietta House out the rear windows uh, of the museum. The beautiful Chancery House scheme is nearby as well. But Sims is probably best remembered for the new suburbs, uh, which we're about to hear about in this great song from Phelan Drew. The two suburbs that embody the vision of the 1930s best were Cabra on Dublin's north side and Crumlin slash Kimmage on the south side. Still around here, no one can tell you where Crumlin starts and Kimmage ends and vice versa. But these two areas witnessed phenomenal new uh, construction. And in the Dublin of the early 1930s, before Sims, Cabra and Crumlin Kimmage would have been you know, entirely rural areas. The construction of new houses there was a massive cultural shock, not only for those who moved out from the inner city, but for the people who lived in those areas before they were transformed. The Behan family who were moved from Russell Street uh, on the north side to Crumlin, or they couldn't agree actually to Behans if they moved to Crumlin uh, or Kimmage. Dominic said they moved to Kimmage, to hell or to Kimmage, he wrote in his memoir. But the one thing they did agree on was they moved. And as Brendan Behan put it, it wasn't so much suburbia as Siberia. The Crumlin native Fiona Watchhorn said that we'd never seen so many houses, all of the same shape and size, and we wondered how the new kids could find their own. All our village houses, cottages, shops, and roads were unique in themselves and very, very seldom resembled those of our neighbours. The culture shock of those great Sims suburbs of the early 1930s uh, is central to the early part uh, of this book. And very little, I think, is written about the experience of moving out to those new suburbias uh, beyond you know, the Behan family and the prior mentioned uh, Fiona Watchorn. But the song Three Lovely Lassies uh, from Kimmage really captures that moment uh, in time. So we're going to hear it from Phelan. Hello, my name is Phelan Drew and I'm a tour guide at 14 Henrietta Street. I'll be singing Three Lovely Lassies from Kimmage for you. And it's, it's a great song, it's a fun song that was played by families in their homes at parties. Um, it's, it's a great song about uh, a Dublin woman, uh, but it also uh, tells us about the lack of opportunities for women when uh, the song was popular. Uh, so I'm joined by the wonderful Sinead White. Um, so uh, this is Three Lovely Lassies from Kimmage. There were three lovely lassies from Kimmage. From Kimmage. From Kimmage. There were three lovely lassies from Kimmage. And mine was the bell of the ball And mine was the bell of the ball There were three lovely lassies from Kimmage From Kimmage From Kimmage And whenever there was a bit of a scrimmage Sure mine was the toughest of all Sure mine was the toughest well, the cause of the realm was Joe Cashin, Joe Cashin, Joe Cashin. For he told me he thought I looked smashing at a dance in St. Anthony's Hall, at a dance in St. Anthony's Hall. But the other two young ones were flippin', they were flippin', they were flippin'. When they saw me and Joe and we trippin' 
That was really, really nice. And uh, one of the one of the great things about these videos today is that you're getting a, a real insight into the into the museum itself. You'll see different parts of it uh, overall. Uh, three videos. That was Miss Dowling's flat, uh, which is an incredible place. If you've ever been inside of it, it's like a time capsule of of uh, Dublin at the moment in time. So it's the very last era of people living uh, in, in kind of tenement living on on, on Henrietta Street. But it has a real emotional effect on people. Uh, visiting visiting that room, I think. It's just the, the everyday, the collection of everyday artifacts and the power they can have in, in transporting us back uh, to a different time. Uh, and later on, when we hear uh, a Lazarus soul, Brian from a Lazarus soul and Brian Mooney, you'll see a different room of the museum, uh, which is the suburbs room. And when I'm talking to Peter Brannigan uh, in just a moment, you'll see what's now the reception uh, of the museum, but once upon a time uh, was the room in which the Brannigan family lived. Uh, Peter Brannigan is a remarkable fellow uh, who I met through the museum, but who's actually been connected to Henrietta Street, uh, even in recent years before 14 Henrietta Street emerged as a museum itself. Some of you might remember in 2013, uh, during the centenary of the 1913 lockout, that the building was opened. Uh, a new productions, fantastic uh, theatrical production company. Tim, in his upcoming talk, will be speaking uh, to Louise Lowe from a new productions uh, put on some really powerful uh, performances in the space. And for a lot of people, including me, I think 2013 was the first time we got inside number 14 and got to see what was happening uh, behind those doors. It was quite incredible uh, to walk around that building and to have it brought to life by, by the art uh, and the vision of a new productions. But Peter tells a, a great story of walking up the street, uh, seeing the door was open, uh, and just being amazed to be back uh, in the very building that he himself uh, had been had been born in, and that really began a relationship for for Peter with the the new uh, fourteen Henrietta Street project. Peter was born uh, in the building in nineteen thirty nine, and his memories throughout the book uh, are quite remarkable. Out of a family of thirteen children, I was the only home birth, and that was down in the basement of fourteen Henrietta Street. I was lucky in one way I was born in the summer because the mortality rate of a child being born in the conditions that we lived in would have been very, very high. The basement, as you know, it is in very, very poor condition. It was wet and cold. We had no electricity and no gas light down in the basement. And we only had candlelight or lamplight. That's the conditions I was born in. But slightly after that, we moved to the smallest room in the house, which is the hallway. 
and there was 13 of us lived there. Now, incredibly, when Peter returned uh, to 14 Henrietta Street, he noticed that a nail still on the wall uh, in that room that his family had lived in was present, on which the Brannigan family uh, had placed a holy picture. And that picture was gifted back to the museum by the Brannigan family and hangs there again. Incredible that that nail, you know, it links the museum to its time uh, as a tenement home. The period that Peter will be talking about in the video uh, that we're about to see was a very different time in the story of Dublin housing from the 1930s. You know, in the 30s, Dublin housing was defined by Cabra uh, and Crumlin Kimmage. The 1950s would likewise transform the shape uh, of the city, but she was moving in different directions. Now came Ballyfar out, Finglas, Donny Carney, and more besides. The way Peter talks about moving to Donny Carney in the book is incredibly moving. We were offered a house out in Donny Carney. My mother's two brothers, Christy and Peter, hired out the handcarts for whatever possessions we had. On the road out to Donny Carney, which is three and a half miles from here, we met other people in the same position. It was a beautiful day, and it was like an exodus of handcarts going up the Malahide Road, going to the new estates. And I always remember the people on the far side who'd already delivered into the new houses, shouting at us, you're going to love it. They're beautiful houses. It was like an exodus, like something you'd see uh, in Russia. I think what really comes true in the book when we're talking about uh, the 1950s is that the social isolation, I think, uh, was much realer uh, for many people in these new suburbias. We talk about some of the very real battles that were fought over sometimes surprising things, like a fruit and vegetable co-op uh, in Ballyfermot or the absence of bus services in the new Northside suburbs. Uh, and if Crumlin and Cabra felt rural to people in the 30s, well, the developments of the 1950s felt entirely alien. The Patrick uh, the TD Patrick Byrne said in the doll, those of us who are involved in Dublin housing problems are only too well aware of how reluctant our people are to accept corporation houses in far outlying places like Coolock, Ballyfermot and Finglas. Ballyfermot is known in the vernacular as Ballyfarout. I have known of many cases where persons sorely in need of housing were put up with inadequate accommodation in the city rather than accept housing in these outlying areas. And in the interview that you'll hear, Peter talks quite movingly about uh, the effect of moving out to these new suburbs, to Donny Carney, on his family and in particular on his mother. So the room that you're going to see in this next clip uh, was once the family home uh, of the Brannigans. That's where we sat and had a chat. And I must warn you, uh, this interview was done before the hairdressers had come back. So Peter, we are sitting in what to me is the reception of 14 Henrietta Street, but what to you was once home. And I gather your story in this building began in a, in a different room entirely. So you have two homes, we might say, within this home. Within this home. Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was a family of 13 children. I was the first home bird. And that was down in the basement of this house here. And as you can see, the conditions, um, it was quite damp because there was no outer doors and of course the wind used to whip in the rain and all like that. Now we, I didn't live down there for too long. Um, I think because I was a newborn child, um, they, we were moved up here into the, the front room here. Yeah. What did your parents do for a, for a living? Because I think there's, a, there's always a perception, when you go back to the census say of 1911, everyone on the streets, a general labourer and that, but it was much more diverse than that in terms of what people did here. Well, uh, my father worked in the, the stationery office. You know, he, uh, he had a steady job. Unlike a lot of people in the street, he had a steady job, but it was a very low paying job. Uh, when you consider that a, a fella on the docks could earn in one day what took my father six days to earn. And it was as simple as that. And that's how low the money was. So we were all, it was always a struggle. But it, was, it was, but it was a struggle for everybody else on the street as well. And that's what makes this street so unique. It's, uh, I think, because of the, the King's, King's Inn above has turned this street into a, a cul-de-sac. Mm. And it made people closer. That's what I felt about it. 
people were closer and we knew each other so well. One of the things that really comes across talking to you about this uh, building and this street, there's sometimes a perception that life here was incredibly difficult, incredibly hard, but you also talk about the great times here and play and your memories of play on the street and be, being young on this street, it was a, it was a playground. Well, well no, absolutely, uh, Donald. I, I talk about the hard times here, but there was great times here, the good times. I talk about the good times because our parents were absolutely brilliant, you know. Um, we didn't recognise the cold or anything else like that. Uh, as you know, we had no toilet facilities whatsoever, um, no sanitation. Um, we lived on the streets from early morning to maybe the last thing at night. Uh, and yeah, loads of games, ghost stories, you know. Ghost stories come from number four across the road there. The best house on the street, and it still is. There was a fear of number four. Number four was where the ghost steps were, <laughs> by the ghost stories. And yeah, and then, and I've often say, I often say to people when they come in here, if you come here a certain time of the day, and it's quiet, you can almost hear the swish of the skipping ropes, you know, and uh, the old little songs, bluebells, cockle shells. Well, I often get that feeling when I'm here. You know. It must have been a very strange uh, contrast to have young lads on the streets, you know, kicking footballs, telling ghost stories, and the barristers coming and going from, from the King's Inn. It's two totally different kind of social well, class. Well, as you know, there's a, ga there's a gap between the, 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 the back gate here to the front gate. And there could be 200 or 300 kids laughing, screaming, going up to that park, but from that, from one gate to the other, total silence. We were always told to respect that the students were studying. So there was, nobody said a word from the gate to the next gate. It's an amazing thing. And as soon as, of course, they got out onto the other side of the gate, Roar. started rolling and shouting again. But for that little short period, from one gate to the other, there was total silence. One, one of the things you told me when we, when we had our chat for the book, that really stuck with me, was you talked about uh, when your family were going from here to Donny Carney, yeah. and they passed other families kind of coming back who had already been there. It's a beautiful moment in your, in your history. Yeah. Well, it was the same to you, uh, Donald, that um, my mother's two brothers, two little men, they brought the, the, the air stuff out on the hand carts, a slug out all the way, and it's all the way up the hill. But funny enough, as soon as we got to the Malahide Road, which is just our Fairview Strand up to Dunny Kearney, and the hill up, and it was a beautiful day, and you know, we were tore, exhausted. But as we came near to Dunny Kearney, there was other people coming back from Dunny Kearney after unloading their hand carts. And they were shouting to us, you will love your houses. And that was the extra sport to bring us on to our houses. It was like uh, an exodus, you know, that, that you would see, you know. People going out with their hand carts, some on pony and traps. But uh, then on you had the other side where they already had moved into their houses and coming back into town. Going out there, I imagine for you, and especially your, your, your brothers, the green space, you know, to kick a ball, all that would have been very important. But um, I remember you telling me that your, your parents found it more difficult, the new, the new community. Well, yeah, well, well, the thing about it is the living conditions was absolutely brilliant. You know, we had uh, running water, we had our own toilet, um, and it was great. We had two little front gardens, and when you went out the back, you had a huge big garden. As we said at that time, it was like going to the Phoenix Park, you know. But the standard of living, the cost of living, was absolutely out of this world, and it made life much tougher. My mother only lasted 10 years. She was a beautiful, vibrant mother, leaving this house, Henry Street. Within 10 years, she was dead. And at that time, I'll show you a photograph of my mother at that time. She looked like 83 years of age instead of 53 years of age. And that's the toll it took. Mm. Because there was extra bus. There was no schools out in Dunnycarney. So we had to get a bus. Bus fares had to be given to us for to go into school and come back again. Uh, 
bus fares have been provided for my father. He worked on the south side of the city. And all of that sort of thing, there had to be sandwiches uh, bought and everything else. So things did get tough. The new furniture had to be bought by the, uh, for the house itself. Uh, we left most of uh, the bedding and everything else was left here because it wasn't worth um, bringing out or, you know, a new gas ones happened to be bought, so money had to be borrowed. And that's when we fell into the hands of uh, the money lenders. Now, the pawn shops, you, you know, I know some people were, were always felt shamed about going to the pawn shops. Uh, I didn't realise anything about that at the time, I was so young, but I was the runner for the family. I'd done all the pawning and dealt with the money lenders at that particular time. And um, the pawn shops, which were great, they had this, the lowest interest rates of all. You could redeem your your pledges, as they were called, after six months. But the money lenders were a different thing. Mm -hmm. And the money, the worst money lenders of all were your, were local neighbours. Yes. The local neighbours were the, became the worst of them because they could intimidate your family. They were in the community, they knew exactly where you were. And, uh, and, uh, and the threat was your, you know, we'll tell your husband. Yeah. You know, so they, they had to live with that. The, the, clergy, the local clergy and uh, local representatives soon became uh, aware of uh, uh, what the, the, about the money lenders and loan sharks and how vicious they could be. And they became very alarmed at this. And uh, with the result, then they started looking for different financial uh, institutions to uh, see what they could do. Now, institutions then at that time financially didn't suit uh, the working class or the unemployed, except for one crowd, the, the League of Credit Unions. Mm -hmm. And of course, then the clergy uh, employed the League of Credit Unions to everywhere across the country. And with the result, there was the credit unions came into their own. But unfortunately, they were the demise of an awful lot of the pawn shops, you know. But, but then as I was getting older, uh, as I say, it was, people felt ashamed having to go to the pawn shop, mm. you know, with pawn in their suits or their bed clothes or their engagement ring or wedding rings and all that sort of thing, you know. It was sort of a shameless about it. And then because I was getting older, I was sort of beginning to feel that shame as well. Yes, and yes. hated the idea of having to go into the pawn shops. Until suddenly, the people that you wouldn't expect to be there, you see them there. <laughs> so that quickly, uh, you know, I lost that, uh, that shamefulness about it, you know. We talk a lot about uh, memory and going back into the past, I suppose, in the, in the, in the present. Uh, this place is so deeply important to you, I think, as you say, because you were born within these walls. Your siblings, how have they found coming back to this place? Has it been hard to get them all back in the door? Well, funny enough, uh, not one of them ever come back to the street. <laughs> not my mother and father, any of my brothers and sisters ever came back to Henry Street. I was the only one. Now, as I became involved in the museum, then they started coming back and then of course um, they remembered yes. they remembered it, that it wasn't a good time mm -hmm. they remembered it was a bad time you know but at the same time now they're delighted that uh, we are involved in the museum my eldest brother my eldest brother uh, didn't want to know anything about this at all you couldn't even mention it to him and he asked us then one week, he asked us, he said, can I go, go in to do a, to, into the 14, back to 14 Henry Harris Street? And of course I rang Charles and uh, yes, Charles said yes. So he came down. My brother died a week after. So he was here and within 10 days he, he had died. Extraordinary that he, he was got to revisit this place. That was the first time. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And you've 
facilitated us meeting so many other people, not only from this house, but the street and the communities more broadly with your tenement memories. Uh, you're obviously someone who believes that there's a great importance for people in talking about the past and in sharing their stories. Has to be, has to be, Donald. You know, for years and years, they've been taking the, the, the rural um, history, folklore, the, the, the Dublin or the Irish folklore. For years, they covered the country. Mm. There was no one taking any stories from the city. Yes. Uh, from from the tenements, you know, that didn't start till I think maybe till sixties and seventies, and as you can see, I mean I'm eighty two now, Donald. So uh, memories fade, you know, and these uh, there's loads of stories out there, and they must be captured. But I also like to think, and maybe you'd be one of the head starters on this, that you would take. The history then from when the people moved out of tenements to new suburbs, the likes of Whitehall, Ballyfermot, Finglas, Crumlin, you know, all these places. What's happened to these people yes. from, from, uh, from the tenements to the new suburbs? That's such a great point you made about the, the, like the National Folklore Commission and the, they would send people off to the baskets to interview yeah. the, the basket weavers, but no one, said that, no one sent anyone down Henrietta Street to talk no, to the elders. Absolutely no one at all. No, and do, uh, people are losing, losing all these stories, and there's so many of them. We'll end on a very, um, I suppose, a positive note of the future. Uh, there's new generations of, of Brannigans who get these great stories from, from you. What's your hope for this museum uh, going, going forward? Do you think that for, for the youth, for school children and others, that it, it offers a particular important place in the city? Well, <coughs> we actually done a program down in the, uh, the school there in uh, Parnell Street, one of the schools there. And uh, we were asked to involve them in uh, the games that we played. And it was a great, uh, I think it ran for about six months, we were doing it for six months, teaching them, you know, conkers, marbles and everything else like that. And then I was sort of telling their story of, of myself, how, <clears throat> I know I didn't go to school very often, but at the time in that school and all these things, and you could sit, you were amazed. You were amazed at this, <clears throat> that there was no electricity, there was no gas, uh, there was, you know, there was uh, no television, no radios, they, and they took all of this in. Mm -hmm. And of course, when the museum was opened, we brought that, this school up to, to here, and they were mesmerized by it. And uh, the younger people can grasp this better than anybody else. But, um, but as you can see here, uh, you know, this when this is up and running, uh, there's so many people coming here. Yeah. And so, young, but young people, I have brought my own nephews and nieces here, and they're actually overwhelmed with, with, with the stories up from the tenement living. So <clears throat> this house lasted 300 years. Well, what's been put into this house will last another 300 years. But now, at the moment, we're capturing those memories, and it's good. Absolutely. Well, isn't that a perfect note to end it on? Peter, you've been such a part of the past of this house, but you and your family are also a, a very important part of its future. And thank you for those words today. Thanks very much, Neil. Uh, I think you'll all agree. A very special interview uh, with Peter, and I hope in time we can get the the, the full interview because uh, we spoke for much longer. Uh, up online, but uh, the point that Peter made, and uh, I think it's a really important point, he talks about how there was always so much emphasis on collecting the, the oral tradition uh, of, you know, different parts of Irish life, but very little work done in that regard in terms of capturing uh, working class history in, 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 in Dublin, but also in the cities uh, more broadly, and I think Peter's recollections are absolutely remarkable, and we're really indebted to Peter because I think his involvement with the museum has opened a lot of doors in terms of other people uh, willing to, to, to talk and, and to share their memories. So we move on then towards, we're heading towards a Lazarus Soul and, and uh, Long Balconies to the period after uh, the movement of people to say Ballyfermot, Donny Carney. 
uh, and the 1960s onwards, which is a really remarkable time, I think, in, in, in the book. It's a time when there was incredible anger uh, in the city around the issue uh, of housing. In 1963, 50 years almost exactly uh, after tenement homes collapsed on Church Street in Dublin's north inner city during the 1913 lockout, it happened again. And that's something that's still very much in the living memory uh, of Dublin when houses collapsed on Bolton Street just around the corner from 14 Henrietta Street and Fenian Street uh, on the south side of Dublin. It was also a time when there was great debate over just how far suburban Dublin should expand. And Unchin McGowan, the architect, uh, activist, and in some ways saviour of Henrietta Street, a number of houses on the other side of the street from the museum were, were saved by Unchin from demolition. He made the point in the 1960s that if the present policy is pursued to its, lo to its logical conclusion, Dublin will become a great dead city with pockets of working class flats in Greek Street, Ben Burb Street, Dominic Street, Cook Street and Vicar Street, but a mere shadow of what she once was. There will be less than half the population of 50 years ago living in the central area, while outside and beyond it in the concrete wilderness of Ballyfermot, Artain, West Finglas, Coolock, Kappa and Clonee, there will be anything up to three quarters of a million people. Now, when researching the 1960s uh, for this book, I think the most remarkable pictures uh, that we found were concerning the Ballymun scheme, uh, the high-rise scheme in Ballymun. And it seems to me that the most radical and the most ambitious proposal uh, in terms of working-class housing in 20th century Dublin, uh, unfortunately, also proved to be uh, its greatest failure. The series of 15-storey and 8-storey flats, the latter... Uh, the 15-storey flats coming in the form of seven towers, named in honour of the executed leaders of the 1916 Rising, and opened during the Golden Jubilee uh, of the insurrection. In some ways, I think it really comes off in the book that the towers represented the latest in the approach to working-class housing on the continent. I mean, there was things about them that were beautiful in terms of modernist uh, design, lifts, underfloor heating, things that could only be imagined uh, before. But much of what was promised for that community was just not delivered on. And by 1968, a journalist who went to Ballymun and interviewed some of the residents found that there was, you know, still optimism. A day spent in random ringing of doorbells brought forth no greater criticisms than complaints about the under-reliability of the lifts or the strength of the central heating. Tentative questions about the rent never brought complaints even where it might be up to five times as much as had been paid in the old place, each tenant was emphatic that it was worth it. But so much of what was promised, as I say, was not delivered. Social alienation quickly set in, reflected in the absence of services, shops, and community facilities. And Ballymun, uh, Bally pardon me, once spoken of as a new town initiative, which would be simultaneously self-reliant and in close proximity to the city, ultimately was under-serviced. I also think there's a lot of anger uh, that comes through when you look at the 60s in Dublin and, and the issue of housing more broadly in terms of things like the uh, Dublin Housing Action Committee. It's a really interesting, quite exciting time uh, in Dublin. And the memories of people uh, from that time, I think, are particularly uh, evocative around the time of the housing collapses. The song Long Balconies by a Lazarus Soul is quoted in the introduction uh, of the book. Nothing was spared. What they had, they shared. They kept their worries to themselves. They knit the community off the long balconies. And when I heard that song for the first time, uh, it really stuck with me. I think a Lazarus soul in their lyrics, they're just so good at painting Dublin scenes. Another song, Midday Class, opens uh, early on with the words, felt like a century long, 16 years since we lifted Sam up by the big ears. Fantastic. And for me, there are very few bands that can capture the spirit of the city as well uh, as, as a Lazarus soul. So Brian Brannigan uh, from the band is going to give us uh, Long Balconies with Brian Mooney from the suburbs room of 14 Henrietta Street. First day of April 1963 Mother fell in the lap of luxury Still tells of the day they handed her the keys Second floor palace, the long balconies 
They did a little dealing in the shade. Still of the cops a priest they were afraid. They hung their washing out there on parade. There was good joy. Nothing was spared. They had they shared. They kept their worries to themselves. They knit the community of the Lombardies. Days they were rough, but no one got upset. Our little homes immaculately kept. The accent was flattened off that we were proud. But only as much as our poverty allowed. Woke Sunday morning, boy, a jobless anger. After Saturday evening, down the black and amber. Two scruffy owners, pelting out folk standards. They sang their hearts out. No one was scared, we had we shared. We kept their troubles to ourselves. We lit the community. Of the Lombardy Whether by flaw or design I suspect They let their kingdom fall into neglect the promises broke the second we had voted. They said that they cared, but had another motive, so that the high tech hadn't far to venture. They needed homes beside the city center. We watched our neighbors slowly disappear. We cried our eyes out. We became scared, we had they shared. They had it sewn up for themselves. They split the community of the Lombardies. But we had a dream, you see, in the Lombardies to never have to leave, to leave the Lombardies. I think that's a really beautiful song. Uh, I think it captures so much about that time and, and more recent times uh, in Dublin and questions uh, around housing. I think there's very, very few bands, as I say, that capture the mood uh, of a city and a place quite like a Lazarus. So the music video uh, for that song on YouTube, if, I recommend having a look at it. Uh, it draws on the, the very rich uh, video archive of Joe Lee. And if you've been uh, to Richmond Barracks uh, in Inchicore. Joe's videos uh, of Kyo Square are, are utilised there, but uh, Joe's work in capturing kind of working class life uh, in, in inner city Dublin and working class housing in Dublin uh, in particular is really, really important stuff. And I, I think the way a Lazarus Soul used Joe's work was, was fantastic. Uh, I think that room that we, we just witnessed the lads performing in, uh, it's so evocative because from out the windows you can, you can see uh, Henrietta House, designed by, by Herbert Sims. So you're in uh, what was one of the tenements of Dublin, looking out at the solutions uh, to the problem. I want to make the point that the book uh, ends very much on a kind of positive note. Uh, the book is entitled From Tenement to Suburbia, and we, we, we do reach a point uh, by which essentially all relatives uh, off the street uh, are gone. And there's some great accounts by... Uh, those who were among the last uh, to, to leave the street. Uh, Catherine Winston talks about the exodus in the 70s. A lot of people moved to Finglas. The place, Finglas and Kulak, it was like moving to the country, really. I think there was a lot of people suffering. 
separation anxiety, I suppose, is what it would be called now. But while the street was no longer a place, I suppose, of tenement living, uh, we do talk in the epilogue about the exciting things that became of Henrietta Street after uh, 1979. You had the arrival of Nepeeper Ilan, a fantastic group right next door to 40 and Henrietta Street, promoting the uh, fantastic Ilan pipes, the Irish equivalent of the, well, no, the, Sc the Scottish bagpipes are the Scottish equivalent uh, of the Irish Ilan pipes. They say a gentleman is someone who can play the Scottish bagpipes and doesn't. But the people of Ilan next door are championing that beautiful Irish instrument, uh, the Ilan pipes. People who really took a chance on the street and moved into it. Some of those houses that were saved by people uh, like Unchin McGowan attracted you know, new Dublin families in the 70s and 80s who had an interest in preservation. People like the Casey's uh, next door. And the Evening Herald made the point that thanks to the actions of those who are moving back onto the street after its tenement residents had gone, they said, the fight for George in Dublin has in one way been won. Everyone now recognises its real value. So while so much of the book is, is you know, about, I suppose, the hardship of, of living conditions in Dublin throughout the 20th century, there's also a lot to celebrate uh, in this book in terms of community spirit. But I think in its closing pages, it's a real celebration of what Henrietta Street has uh, become. And, you know, for a history book, I think it ends with a sense of the future and the possibilities of that street. And certainly 14... Uh, Henrietta Street, while it is a museum dedicated to telling the story of the past, uh, it's also a place that is, you know, looking forward uh, and looking forward with great confidence and, and optimism for the street in future. I'd love to take uh, some questions that came in there, but I, I, I really hope people enjoy uh, the book. I hope they enjoy Melanie's book, Tim's book too. And I think you have to understand Henrietta Street really as a microcosm uh, of the story of Dublin in both its, its rise, demise, and even its, its, its rebirth. I think the story of the city, the Hibernian metropolis in the broadest sense, you can probably tell it better through this, this one street than, than any other in town. Thank you, Donal, so much for that. And thank you to everybody who was involved in those videos, Phelan Drew and Sinead White and Brian Brannigan and Brian Mooney, and in particular, Peter Brannigan, who um, has been such a... Um, such a such a wonderful person for us to know at the museum and Dona was talking about the um, fact that the people we meet who have connections to 14 Henrietta Street really help bring the story of the building alive and um, we can see in the Q&A there that it, um, there are many many of you who have family connections to the tenements um, which is amazing we might read out some of those in a minute um, if anyone's interested in talking to us a bit more about those memories um you are more than welcome to get in touch with us at memories at 14 henrietta street.ie we're always looking to talk to more people about that um part of dublin's history so um so looking at the q a now someone says up here great to hear peter brannigan pronounce it dunny carney my mother moved from dominic street to dunny carney and still calls it dunny carney <laughs> very good the vernacular <laughs> Brilliant. Um, uh, Dave says, Donal, is there any chance you could do an up-to-date Strumpet City TV program about inner city tenements and their people? You know what? One of the one of the peculiar things about Henrietta Street that uh, I think should still be the still the still a book for someone in this is the street as a filming location, which is really fascinating. Henrietta Street mostly appears on on the big screen or the small screen as uh, London. It's kind of the perfect George and Terrace Street. So. There's kind of like fake red post boxes that sometimes pop up on, on Henrietta Street when they were filming over the years. But I think the most moving thing that was ever filmed on the street was Strumpet City, uh, the masterpiece of, of James Plunkett. Now, they changed the name of the street, but the, but the fact they used Henrietta Street, I think it says a couple of things. One, so much of that landscape of Dublin had, had been lost. Uh, but two, you know, of, of, of what was left, it was the definitive street to use. Uh, and I think James Plunkett... Uh, deserves incredible credit for for not only Strumpet City but everything he wrote. Uh, he really captured the the risen people and even his book of essays. He really captured the spirit of of working class Dublin. And I, I think Plunkett deserves to be better remembered. So yeah, if someone wants to uh, throw a few quid at the Broadcasting Authority to do a, a documentary on, on on Plunkett, it would definitely be well worth doing. I think there'd be a lot of interest in that. Uh... Vincent Jackson says that uh, in his family's early days of moving from Bishop Street to Ballyfermot, there was a lot of prejudice against them because of um, where they lived. 
And uh, in the 60s and 70s, people were known to give different addresses when applying for a job, because if you mentioned where you came from, you never even got an interview. Yeah, um, yeah, they're very true. And actually, a very similar anecdote to my own family about that, too. It was funny, like from 10 minutes up the road, it was, it was easier to be employed. And even locally, you know, big employers that there were glass ceilings within companies uh, for local people. It's extraordinary. The language around Ballyfermot and the papers is particularly interesting. Uh, you know, what's going on in the world when at the time when, when, when Ballyfermot is, is laid out. Some people refer to Ballyfermot in the press as Little Korea. Uh, so there was, there was a particular, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say disdain, that's the wrong word. But the, yeah, I think the, Bally, those schemes in the 50s, uh, the way in which the, there isn't the same optimism that was there in the 30s towards Cabra and uh, and and Crumlin and some of the language around Ballyfermot and its and its people uh, in the in the press in the 50s is, is remarkable. There's a question here from Eileen. Uh, brilliant talk, Donal. Have you any idea how rents being charged in the new suburban housing in the 30s compared to what people were paying in the tenements? That's a brilliant question, and the reason we don't have. Uh, a comparative answer to that is that there was no regulation in terms of that was what the, really the problem with the tenement. Uh, one of the problems with the tenement crisis in Dublin was that it was so unregulated, so people were entirely at the mercy uh, of of landlords in a very unregulated uh, space. So, if nothing else, uh, and some like people sometimes talk about Kathleen Behan, Brendan's mother, talks about the uh, the stresses of the formalities of life uh, in Crumlin. You know, that you had to deal with certain people in, in the corporation all the time. You had dates you had to meet there. You, things were very formal. There was rules, there was regulation. Uh, but on, on, on one level, I think that was probably better than just the un, un, unscrupulous private landlord who could up rent at a minute's notice. I mean, the corporation couldn't do such things in the same way. Grania says, such a lovely but moving interview with Peter Brannigan. So sad to hear of his mother's early death and the worry of the money lenders. My dad would have lived in the Ivy Trust and has told me great stories of the pawnbrokers too. Many a family seem to have survived that because of the pawnbroker. God bless Peter and his family and thank you for sharing the story. Yeah, we hear a lot about the um, pawn shops um, through the Your Tenement Memories Oral History projects. And uh, one of the popular pawn shops around Henrietta Street was Brereton's on Capel Street, which is still going today. Yeah, it still has the, 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 the three golden balls, the symbol of the pawn shop. And there's another example of it on uh, Marlborough Street. You still have the symbol of the, the pawn shop there too. Really important part of uh, social history in Dublin. You know, the bank of the poor in many ways. Uh, another question here. Hi, Donal. Hello from Kulak. Great talk and three brilliant videos. Was there a bigger Dublin north side, south side divide before the suburbs? Yeah, great question. I, 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 someone was talking to me recently about uh, they're working on a project on the River Liffey and the north side, south side division. Uh, it's always been there. It, it took different forms, though, through the ages. Uh, once upon a time, it was Drumcondra FC uh, in Talca Park, who are the... the, the uh, the north side team of note and Chamber Grovers on the other side. So there's always been a rivalry uh, between the north side and, and, and the south side. But it's interesting, isn't it, that the great 1930s suburban uh, experiments, one ends up on the north side, one ends up on the south side. And they're almost an exact uh, similar distance from the city centre core, Crumlin and, 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 and Cabra. So both the north side and the south side experienced the, the same experiment in almost the exact same way uh, at the same time. Um, Mary says, I'm so pleased that people who have been ignored for so long are now being valued and recognised for their contribution to the history of Dublin. My mother grew up with her family in a tenement on Dorset Street. They moved to Cabra West in the 1940s. My generation and generations to come can be very proud of our inner city tenement roots. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and for bringing us to 14 Henrietta Street. Thank you, Mary. Hope, you, hope it won't be too long before you can visit on a tour. Um, and I, I just want to make, make a point on, on that. Uh, I think an awful lot is owed to Kevin Kearns, uh, an, an American uh, social historian, and an oral historian. And a lot of you probably have a, a Kevin Kearns book on, on the shelves. Uh, Dublin Tenement Memories was perhaps the most famous of them, but he wrote a number of books uh, around different aspects of life in, in, in Dublin. Uh, Dublin Pub Life and Lore, another great one. Uh, one on Stony Batter, one on Dublin Women Workers too. And uh, Cairns, I think Kevin, he opened a lot of doors for other historians in the sense that he convinced uh, working class people that their stories were important. 
And, you know, he sat down with people who worked in the markets uh, and, you know, put their memories, their recollections into into print. I think that was a really important thing, uh, what, what Kevin Kearns did in terms of opening up that kind of oral history. So, yeah, it does sometimes take uh, a bit of effort to convince uh, everyday people. I don't like the term ordinary people. None of us are ordinary. But the everyday people who move the wheels of the world, uh, that their stories are important. And they fundamentally are. Uh, and I think Peter really captured that in, in the interview, that... You know, these stories deserve to be deserve to be captured. Yeah, and Donna, you know yourself from being involved in the oral history project that often the people we meet who think they have nothing to share have the most. Absolutely. You know, you come and sit down and say, Oh, I've got I haven't got too much to talk about, and then an hour later you're still there. Yeah. Still there talking to them. If you take someone who lived on Henrietta Street, for example, it's very likely that if they're if they're a woman, uh, they probably worked in Williams and Woods. You know the great the great big sweet and jam factory just down the road uh, a lot of the men on the street would have worked in the fruit and vegetable market that's currently being being restored uh, in a big way and you get incredible stories of this, the local economy uh, from people but because it's what they did every day uh, they often don't think this is important but it's hugely important it's labor history it's social history uh, and you can't really understand an area without having a sense of of, of all that stuff so you have the things that people think were every day in their own lives are actually really, really important in helping us to under understand Henrietta Street in the broadest sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, Bree has a great question here. It's striking that Henrietta Street was surrounded by schools, shops, transport, work and churches, but they moved to places with hardly any facilities. Why do you think that the planners didn't think of these? Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Um, there's, there's housing inquiries in, in the 30s, some of which are quoted in the, in the book. And Sims, actually, of all people, makes the, the point that you cannot move the number of people we've moved to Crumlin without providing for the other necessities uh, of life. And Sims is actually quite angry when you read the, the reports and what he tells that inquiry that, you know, he feels you, you just cannot do this. You know, he asks why we're not building schools uh, from the very get go in, in, in these places. So uh, it, it doesn't just like Sims gave us the homes, but a lot of the social problems the, the the gaps that weren't filled uh, around them he was very conscious of and they were they were above his pay grade so to speak but yeah absolutely it is it is ast astonishing uh, how little thought went into providing for those things rosita sweetman the journalist fantastic journalist uh, rosita sweetman as a young woman in her 20s wrote a book called on our knees where she traveled around the island of ireland and interviewed uh, interesting people in 1960s ireland about you know the state of the world but when she went to Ballymun, uh, she made the point that there's so many children here, she said, and there's so little for them to do. She said, if this place erupts, you know, in, in 10 or 15 years, it's very obvious to me walking around and seeing the lack of, 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 of amenities, why that, why that could happen. Uh, Ashling says, a Lazarus soul. Wow, that song brought back memories and thoughts of my grandparents. My great aunt Lizzie was Mrs. Dowling and my grandmother was her sister, Joanna Buchanan. And three generations of our family lived in number 14 and they moved to Cabra. Wow, Ashlyn, it's so lovely to have you here this evening. Thank you for sharing that. And the Dowling family lived in that room that you would have seen in the first video. Um, they were, we were lucky enough to meet them uh, when the museum was in development and um, they were really uh, crucial in how that room Came, became what it was and in you know in many cases donated some of their own family possessions to to furnishing that room so what you see when you're in that room is is as um the family would have had it so thank you so much Ashling, for sharing that it's always lovely to hear from a dowling um Polly asks i would love to know how peter brannigan's family lit their basement home was it candles for example yeah, and he tells extraordinary stories of how, um, it sounds like the Dublin of, of O'Casey's age, of how people moved through uh, the building, you know, dr uh, lighting sheets of paper and kind of dropping them down the stairs to, to guide them on, on their way. Just extraordinary, the, the dependency that still existed. And even when you're reading about the 60s and the great progress, so like, but like in some ways the, the Ballymun schemes were just so modernist in terms of what went into them. Uh, you read about people in the inner city still living without electricity, which is absolutely remarkable to me. Dave has a follow-up question um, about that discussion about the suburbs. Uh, he says, is it true that Tala was designed 
with that in mind, they knew no infrastructure was going to be built, so designed the estates so they couldn't be defended by its inhabitants. <laughs> or is this an I've heard that too, yeah. I, I, I'm not, I think that might be a little bit like the design of UCD. Uh, a good, uh, they say UCD was designed so the students couldn't riot in it. But I think that might be something of, 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 of an urban myth. But then the, that time, Miles Wright, uh, the planner, and just the growth is actually, I'll dig it out because there's an incredible fact on Talat towards the end of the book in terms of numbers, which just blows me away in terms of how the population uh, of Talat blew up. I can find it. Yeah, Talat really fascinates me. I think there's, there's a great study for someone to do in the, in the expansion of Talat. 4,605 people called Tala home at the time of the 1961 census. By 1981, it was home to 69,563 people. That is just extraordinary. From less than 5,000 people to almost 70,000 in a very, very short period uh, of just two decades. There are loads of um, memories coming through here. I wish we had time to read them all out. They're just amazing. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Ken, Ken Larkin, uh, great man for, for local history in, in, in Ballyferm, who's done so much. I see you mentioned Eamon McAmosh, absolutely. Uh, very much uh, deserving of, of praise. And, and likewise, convincing people of the need that, uh, to tell their stories, that their stories were important. And David Shaw Smith, who only died earlier this year, uh, producer of that brilliant TV program, Dublin, A Personal View. Uh, essentially, Eamon McAmosh traveling around the city of Dublin, talking to people. It was just incredible television. Uh, Eamon, just like uh, Kevin Kearns, opened, opened a lot of doors, doors that are, are still open today. Uh, Mark says, my wife's grandparents lived in Bayview Avenue in Ballybock. They came out to check the new houses being built in Merino and decided they were too far out in the country. <laughs> yeah, that a lot. Um, can I ask when the books will be published and are they hardback or paperback? Um, I, can, I can answer that. At the moment, they are hardback, I believe. Um, Donal, I don't know if you have one handy. Might, might be a good moment. To... There you go. Those are, those are the three books. They're available now. Um, I can pop the link in the chat box again if you're interested in um, checking them out. Uh, lovely books. They're kind of embossed on the front as well. Um, so it kind of got a bit of a texture to them. So I'll put the link for that again in the chat. Um, Deirdre says, thanks for the talk. I come from Ballyferma and my dad was from Sheriff Street. I'm currently transcribing his memoirs written in 1986. Wow. My uncle always called my mama Colchi, who came from Inchicore. <laughs> 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 very good very good well, feel free to get in touch with me there through the through the, uh, through the museum and, and i'd love to give you any guidance i can on on, on that that sounds like a, a great project though a bit unfair uh, now on, on someone from inchicore brendan bean always insisted that anyone from beyond the canals was a culture well there you go and he went to live then he went to live in ballsbridge uh, dave says our pawn shop in fingless east the quiet part was the rag and bone man kept a lot of families going was he a part of tenement history or was it rural? Absolutely. There's actually, there's a great picture of uh, a rag and bone man that pops up sometimes on, on uh, kind of Dublin history pages. Extraordinary. Uh, so yeah, it was a, no, I think less of a phenomenon in, in the urban environment, but still there, still there. I think the picture was actually taken in uh, Crumlin and it's in the National uh, Folklore Collection. Brilliant. I think we're um, just about coming to the end now. I don't know whether there's anything else there in the Q&A, Donal, you'd like to um, comment on um, before we wrap up. There's a couple of questions about when the recording of this talk will be available. Um, don't have an exact uh, date yet, but hopefully in the next um, next few weeks, couple of months, uh, you can find out when that's available on our website and social media channels. Uh, Deidre says, Interesting to hear Peter's comment about the local moneylenders. My granny called the moneylender Mrs. Conscience. <laughs> very good. Very good. And great comments from, from Jason, Vincent, Breed, everyone else. Just really, and Dave, Mark, really, really fascinating comments. And uh, thanks to everyone who took the time to, to type them. Yeah, thank you so much. I wish we had a chance to read them all out. But as I say, we would love to hear more from you. If you want to get in touch with us, please do email us at memories at 14 Henrietta Street. Um, we'd love to kind of keep having these conversations. As you saw today through Peter's, um, Donald's chat with Peter, the, these are so important. This is how we keep the story of the tenements um, going. This is how we um, keep the story of the building alive. Um, so 
most of the collection of the building is actually oral histories and stories. So um, do get in touch. We might um, we might wrap up there and let you all get back to your evening. So Donald, thank you once again so much for that. Um, another amazing um, talk, a bit different to usual. Um, thank you all for tuning in and we'd love to see you at some other talks in the future. Um, so uh, throughout June, all of the Tea Time Talks are going to be celebrating those three publications. So our next one is on Wednesday, the 23rd of June. And that is um, about Timothy Murta's book, Grandeur and Decline, 1800 to 1922. And he is going to be talking to Louise Lowe, who um, is the director of Anu, who produced Live in the Lockout and Hentown in Henrietta Street. Um, over the past few years, they're going to be talking about under siege Dublin tenement life, 1913 to 1916. And on Wednesday, the 30th of June, Melanie Hayes, who wrote the first book in the series, Georgian Beginnings, 1750 to 1800, will be talking about those early years of the house. Um, so you can... Uh, go to our website and sign up on those they're all free and as well as tea time talks the, the wider dublin city council culture company does lots of other programs so the other building we look after is richmond barracks and in Chicor, out in the country as we saw just now uh, that runs a talk series called mondays at the mess which is um uh, every, every um, monthly on mondays and we also run a culture club, which is a series of talks and tours exploring um, cultural spaces of the city and the National Neighbourhood, which is a year round program that creates ways for people to make connections with culture in their places. So do go on to the Dublin City Council Culture Company website if you're interested in finding out about any of those. Hope we see you at more talks in the future and maybe even have a chat with some of you um, and have a lovely evening. Thank you again for coming.